I'd love to know how many of you eat seaweed. I'd be checking out the first row there until I got a mic. <laughs> They're all seaweed eaters. What about up the back row there? Yeah, middle row as well. What types of seaweed do you enjoy? Carrageen, dusk, dots, lava. And sea, sea spaghetti. Great. That's great. And anybody on this side volunteering? The same, Carrigan, Dulisk. And Larry, have by any chance the Wakami? Yeah, yeah, good. That's great. There is seaweed, I had some last call, and there was a seaweed which we called Trapon. Okay. So which one is that? Trapon is, we never called it Trapon. Actually, I might get that survey out off you, Ian. Okay. Because once I start digging in here, um, I go to, you know, the alginates all over the. Uh, <laughs> the uh, slide mover. This one would be slawok, and uh, that's the Japanese nori, and uh, yeah, and that's our own Irish slawok, and very often people, now the, around it is the carrageen, and uh, just Sarah made this decorative out uh, just at the, at the demo table. Uh, so this is actually our, um, our own slawok, our own nori, our lava, purple lava. They call it, um, in Wales, they call it um, lava as well. Um, so the Japan, they call it that in Mayo, but it's actually a browner version and it's just a different variety of the Slauk or the Nori. That's great. I got my hands stuck in straight away. Um, so that's it. And anyway, I'm going to leave these and we can bring them up when we're going up to taste the smoothie. And I was happy to see that nobody bolted out of here when the word green smoothie was mentioned. It's actually really nice, so do taste it at the end. And then this is the Carrigan. And uh, I'm going to go through these. What I'll probably do is, if I, if I introduce myself, so we started there with, with questions right away. Where did he put the serviettes? Oh, under this one. Okay, great stuff. That's great. So just to introduce myself, um, I've grown up in Sligo. You probably saw that shot there um, of, there we go, um, of my husband's uh, little boat that he enjoys going out in in the summertime. Um, and putting down a few uh, lobster uh, nets or pots. Um, and I've um, medically trained, I'm a GP and I currently work in public health and I've grown up using seaweeds all my life um, because we were fortunate in that we're on the coastline in Sligo and when we were small children, my father, he was also a medic, he practiced dentistry, he did medicine and dentistry. And uh, he had just a knowledge and a great love of everything to do with the sea. And uh, he passed it on to us. So I was actually interviewed just earlier when I came here by a journalist from the UK. And I was saying to her that we actually complained quite a lot at Christmas time when um, we were small kids and we were brought out um, during the Christmas holidays. And we would, after the first frosts, um, with my parents, harvest the slough and bring it home and the great tradition was to actually um, boil it up for about four hours and then it was like spinach and have it with the dinner and we just loved it. But it used to be pretty cold out there on the beaches because you have to kind of pick it bits and pieces here with, with your hands, pick it off the rocks. Does it ring a bell with anybody? We're, we're going to see some of the shots anyway of it. Um, so again, that's the coastline where there's plenty of, of rocky pools and at the mention of rock pools, uh, welcome to Dara, um, who's a photographer and actually came to that one of those spots in Sligo and has an exhibition. Jewels of? Jewelry box. Jewelry box. Jewelry box. That's it. So just a tide book. Are any of you boaters or um, swimmers or where you have a tide book for your local area? Yeah, hands going up. Really important to have the tide book um, because I looked at it um, just the other day and I could see that there was a fabulous, the lowest tide of the year, the one that would go out. If you just look at, at that there, down near me, I'm in the, the deep water here, and up at the top of the roof would be the, the sand and the grass. Do you get that in terms of the, the gradients on the shore? Um, all those photographs are in the book anyway. Um, we don't photograph away, but they're all actually, everything that I use here is actually in the book. Um, the, the, the tide uh, just last week was the best one in, in the whole year, where it actually went out the furthest and came in the, 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 the strongest as well, and there was a storm behind it, it did quite a bit of damage. But we had a glorious hour where we went down and pottered about in that space that's uncovered um, not very often at such a very, very low tide. 
It was just amazing the, the, uh, to check on everything that was there. It's, it's also quite amazing to be there, and you know that six hours afterwards it's going to be covered in just crashing waves. So it's really quite exciting. So why did I put that up? I suppose I put it up because um, if you look closely at it, you could tell about, what, maybe 10 different vegetables there? Um, you know, you can look at your peas and your kohlrabi and your lettuces and your bit of kale peeping out and so on. And yet we don't look on seaweeds that way at all. We just call them seaweeds. And then when I checked around with you, you could name them, but most people can't. It's just kind of seaweeds and there's a bit of a yolk factor there as well. So they're just some of the names and some of them are here. The, the disc. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get the sea spaghetti and it is coming into season and it's absolutely beautiful and it's, um, it's just really just young and tender at the moment and it's one of those uh, really traditional things that we have around St. Patrick's Day because when you harvest the sea spaghetti or indeed if you buy it um, wrapped in its, in its bag in the shop and you cook it, it turns green and uh, when it's cooked with spaghetti um, around St. Patrick's Day and mixed with the, with the spaghetti, it's just a real favourite. Um, the nori I've shown you, the slug, the porphyra. Laminaria digitata is the one that breaks up in the fingers. And um, I don't have, I do have Laminaria digitata um, here, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with in that you'd recognise this from the shore. And it's digitata because it breaks up into the fingers. It starts out as a nor. So it's called oarweed because it starts like an oar. And you can see that, can't you? That at one stage in its life, it was an oar. And then with the storms, it breaks <coughs> up into the fingers. So it's digitata, the digits. And that, of course, is kombu. That's our kombu from, um, that's very similar. I mean, it's not the actual one. It's, it's laminaria digitata. There's, it's different. It's uh, mainly used laminaria uh, japonica. And what else have I on the list there? My Laria, I don't have because it was just a tiny little bit of it. It's quite young. Our Carrageen is here. Our Condus Crispus, our Master Carpus stellata. They're different, uh, two, two varieties that we have at down where I am. And there was a bit of sea lettuce. And if something bright green pops out, you'll know that that's it. There was just a tiny little bit. It was just coming, just coming into season. But I have photographs anyway. Uh, and again, at least to warm up a little bit before it actually comes in. I'll just <coughs> leave that out on the, on the side there. Um, next on my list, sea grass. They're both ulva. They're both the same. Um, the bladder rack, the fucus fasciculosus. Does that ring a bell for those of you at, who were doing biology at school? The fucus fasciculosus, the bladder rack. Quite amazing, quite amazing. And do remind me, or maybe I should tell you now, should I throw in a little bit of the science bit now? Because I was going to do the science bit at the start, and then we'd relax and look at the photographs of the food. So, while well, you're all really alert and concentrating, the fucus fasciculosus, um, I think is medically, I think is going to be quite an amazing plant in the future. Um, or sea, or algae, or marine algae. Uh, simply because if any of you know of anybody who ever had um, Helicobacter pylori, the H pylori, and needed a blast of antibiotics to actually get rid of it. This um, particular seaweed actually has the same binding site um, and it can bind to the, to the bacteria in the stomach and eliminate it from the body. And it's very interesting research happening at the moment. Isn't that incredible? You know, that and it's just there, uh, pardon me? That's the blood rack, fucus fasciculosus. And it's just that it's, it's um, totally neglected. It's also one of the uh, rich sources of fucos, um, which is when we're all concentrating, as we are now, we're all fucosylating, or at least I hope you're all fucosylating, and taking in the knowledge. And we need fucose, and this is one of the richest sources of it. So I think both from the brain point of view and from the point of view of actually eliminating that particular bacteria, I think it's got a very bright future ahead of it medically. Uh, our sugar kelp is like, isn't it like um, that material that we used to have long ago, crippling. Isn't it crippling? And have a feel of it um, later on when you get a chance to just have a little feel of them. The sargassum, thankfully, isn't here yet. It came into us from Japan about 10 years ago, and it's tending to uh, get into the spot where the native plants are and toss them out. 
and the ASCO I showed to you. Um, funny enough, we don't tend to eat ASCO, we put it on the garden, it's called egg rack. So that's just a few of the names, just running, running through them. I show you that slide, I know you've all been at work today probably, and the last thing you need is a slide. I show you that slide simply to point out the gaps in it. And when I was actually compiling the book, The Irish Seaweed Kitchen, I only put in facts that I could stand over as a medical doctor that were evidence-based. So we can stand over the fact that particular seaweeds have certain uh, nutrients. But look at the gaps. We need more researchers. Because you know, obviously we, we know about the minerals, the vitamins, trace elements, but some of the particular seaweeds, we just don't, we can't pinpoint exactly what's in them. Some of the nutritional highlights um, of the different seaweeds. Quite amazing that the, the, our silk, our nori, back to it again, is up to 40% protein. Isn't that amazing? Up to 40% protein. Um, olive this was our olive a little bit of sea lettuce, up to 25%. And we know that um, some of the amino acids, the glutamate, that the word umami comes from the glutamate, that, that taste and feel on, on the tongue. The fats are very small but very significant. A lot of work happening there in Denmark uh, by um, one of the researchers there. Uh, the carbohydrate, well, we, we know that it would be maybe over 60%. Uh, and looking there at the, the vitamins and minerals, particularly the iron, and Dillisk uh, being particularly high in iron. But again, with my medical hat on, I'd ask the question, well, just how much of it is available to the body? What's the bioavailability? Because we're told that 8 grams of the dried Dillisk would equal 100 grams of raw steak just how much of that is actually um, absorbed by the body. So again, lots more research needed. Again, we look at some of the, um, the iodine in the seaweeds. If, you're, if you have a thyroid problem, I suggest that you wouldn't eat seaweed apart from nori, which you see there is the, um, the, the lowest, this one here, in terms of iodine. This is, whoops. We have to straighten that one up. This is the World Health Organization cutoff point uh, for, for the actual iodine levels in the body. So we shouldn't exceed that on a daily basis. So if we look at some of these, our, our kelps are our big combos. We need to be careful with those, and we need to um, ensure that the iodine, that we don't just overdo the big kelps. Small amounts of a wide variety of seaweeds is the secret, really, so that you're getting that synergy between them. In fact, there was a paper brought out in the States where researchers looked at that. Um, I've been saying it for years, and they actually came up with the conclusion after analyzing um, the, the particular seaweeds that it's the synergy between a wide variety of seaweeds that actually um, makes a difference and gives you the best, best um, health gain. Again, don't look too carefully at that slide, just to show you that the drugs that are on the market at the moment, the marine drugs, none of them are, have seaweed in them, which I find very interesting. The closest you get is that little snail there who actually feeds on the ova. That's the closest that you get as an analgesic, as a, as a pain reliever. <coughs> so I promise you there are only a couple of slides that have the sciencey bit, and then we get into the, um, the, the shots of the food. Are you all okay so far? You're all with me so far? Because one of the things that I found very interesting, I was invited to speak in Seattle during the summer at, um, to give the presidential address to the Phycological Society of America. Phycology is the study of seaweeds. So this is the Phycological Society of America. And they were particularly looking at the research. And as a result of that, I really probed quite a lot to see what was happening and, and what was evidence and what was anecdotal and where was everything with, with seaweed. And I found it extraordinary that in Scotland, uh, this piece of research was happening. And my thanks to um, Gordon MacDougall, who actually um, allowed me to talk about this. It was published in 2011 in uh, Food Chemistry, an incredibly interesting paper, where they were looking at a couple of things. Um, they were looking at looking at they were looking at the polyphenol content and the antioxidant. Now you all know about antioxidant, probably probably the most common antioxidant that we all tend to know about. Vitamin C. So again, the, their starting point was um, berries, because they were doing a lot of research in berries. So they looked at the polyphenol content and the antioxidant content of the seaweeds that they were given. 
They also wanted to look at the effect of the seaweeds on cancer cells, the effect of the seaweed on some digestive enzymes, and just how available they actually were. And this was happening in Scotland. So, so they were literally moving from berries to seaweed. And raspberries were actually their, their highest um, in terms of antioxidant effect and polyphenol content. And they were absolutely gobsmacked because what happened was all of the seaweeds surpassed the raspberries in terms of the polyphenol content and antioxidant activity. Isn't that amazing? And yet, when I, when I go shopping, and I sometimes I feel guilty and I look at it for a very long time if I see raspberries that are in from America and it's out of season and I have to sadly pass them by and try and wait for the Irish ones to come in. But it is something that we tend to, to know that berries are just so high and so good in everything and so good for us and, and yet we bypass our very own seaweeds. And we saw there that the, um, the ASCO was the highest, that's the egg rack, the one we put in our garden, that most people put in their gardens. Uh, next was Palmaria palmata, which was the dillisk. Um, oh no, the next was the Alaria Escalente, and, and I'll show you photographs of that because it's just very young at the moment, it's just not quite in, in yet. And you see where the raspberries fell, and that was their actual, their Glen Ample was their finest, best raspberry that sort of bet everybody prior to this till the seaweeds came along. Isn't that interesting? So uh, that was just a little summary of the anti-cancer effect that um, the proliferation of the colon cancer cells were reduced um, by the seaweed polyphenols. And again, it was the Ilaria that seemed to have the, the um, what was the most effective. But the others were active as well. So I suppose that was the, the summary of that paper. And again, if, uh, Ian will have it, because I'll send it to him uh, when I get home. Um, so they're just talking about the actual amount of polyphenols that are in it, and just how the bioactives uh, can actually in the future. Now again, this was all happening in test tubes and none of it was happening actually in people. But again, it's just an indication of where seaweeds are actually going. And they were talking there that the um, inhibition of the, uh, particular of the starch enzymes was probably due to this fluorotalin. And I'll come to that in a second. Um, this is another study. So that was Scotland. So near home, just up in Northern Ireland, um, in the University of Ulster in Coleraine, there's a fantastic study happening at the moment. It's the Swafox. I, I'm not quite sure. Seaweed derived, and yeah, they just had to kind of get a fancy title for it, basically. Something that kind of rhymes so they could put it for the EU funding. So um, Swafox, um, seaweed derived anti-inflammatory agents and anti-oxidants, um, Swafox. So again, if you Google it, I'll give you the details on that for anybody who wants to read up some more about it. But they had, um, I think it was 80 volunteers, I had a slide on it anyway. These are the, um, the, 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 really the antioxidants that we're sort of very familiar with, that we get them from fruit and we're told to, um, you know, obviously eat uh, healthy in terms of vegetables, uh, fruit and vegetables and the green tea and so on. So we're very familiar with these. But um, the floral tannins, do you see this one? That's just their uh, floral tannins. So the seaweeds have all of the others as well, the flavonoids, the tannins, the catkins and so on. But they have this floral tannins, which is totally unique to brown seaweeds. And it's showing huge potential. So as, a, as an antioxidant. So again, just watch that spot, I suppose, is what, I, what I'm saying. And we know um, just the potential actions and the benefits and so on in terms of reducing inflammation and, and really being sort of all-rounders in terms of um, slowing down cell um, damage and, and so on. Uh, that particular study, as I, as I was saying, is in a, in a particular place which is dedicated. It's called the um, NICHE, which I think is it um, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, Centre for anyway. It's completely dedicated to um, to human interventions, and they they took eighty um, they had eighty volunteers. 
and they did various um, bloods and urine samples on them. And I'm just absolutely dying to find out what the results are. I actually phoned them this week and to see was there any news that I could bring you for how the studies were going. Um, but the director was away and I didn't really want to contact the other researchers because it would have been a bit unfair. They might have spilled some beans or something and then you'd have it ahead of everybody else. So we had to sort of wait, wait patiently. But it's worth looking at that. You can get more information on it if you look at www.seaweedforhealth.org. So that will actually give you what's happening and how the, um, in terms of the, whether it's a positive result in terms of the polyphenol effect on the 80 volunteers. Are you all with me so far? We're nearly at the end of the science bit and we'll be coming to the other bit. Are you all looking forward to tasting your smoothie? Yeah? Oh, that's great, because I'm going to get a quick demo um, as well. So how, now that we have the knowledge, how do we bring it to our dining table, or a bit of fine dining, in fact? Um, I'm not pretending for a moment that my dining table looks anything like this. Uh, this was when we did the launch for all the um, food journalists. When we were launching the book, we did a preview. Because seaweed can be scary for everybody, including food journalists, so we invited them to a day by the sea. And that was part of it. Actually, what they did was they gave the, um, the lunch a standing ovation. Um, so that really was a sort of a seal of approval, really, at that time for the book. So we get it into foods like breads. And again, I was saying to the journalist that you know, every child in the world loves bread. And they're doing some studies in, I forget which university, I, it could be Leeds, but I, I could be wrong, uh, where they're actually putting it into bread. And they're, uh, it's, it's an anti-obesity study. So it's just more filling. The bread is more filling with the, with the actual seaweeds in it. That's a shot of Dillisk. Would you recognize it? Yeah, and so important that if anybody is going out to have a little nibble of dillisk uh, from the shore, that you bring a sharp scissors and you give the dillisk a little haircut here, that there's never any pulling from the rocks. Because if you go out and you actually want a little bit of parsley from your own garden, would you go out and pull it up? Or would you bring a little scissors or um, nip it off with your fingers or whatever? It's the same with the seaweed. So remember, going to the sea, you have to bring up scissors. sharp scissors. And you can give a little haircut. Now, technically, you're not supposed to actually remove anything from the seashore at all, um, unless you have a license. But I think if people are educated, and we all go along, we have a license. So obviously, I wouldn't, um, this isn't illegal or anything here. But <laughs> <laughs> illegal stuff. So bring your scissors, a little haircut. Just, do you see what I'm saying there? Just along there, a little nibble. And then the plant is perfectly safe to grow on and to actually continue to reproduce. So that's Dillisk. And Dillisk is wonderful in breads. And I've got just loads of recipes um, for, the, for the Dillisk um, in the different breads, like the Dillisk and cheese scones, and all kinds of different breads, and so on. Moving on to sushi, again, there's, uh, they're all recipes uh, from the book with the sushi. And with the sushi, we have the, it's wrapped in the nori, um, as I was saying earlier. That's, most of the photography for the book was done by Romas Ford from the Observer Food Monthly. I was very lucky to get him. And the second half of the photography was done by Yumiko uh, from Japan. And she was stunned to be able to go to Strija. Do you recognize Ben Bulbul Mountain there in the back? And she could actually harvest a little bit of uh, the slauk, the nori, and bring it home and cook it. You can't do that in Japan. It's all aquaculture. Um, so it's very interesting. That's me on an island where they actually used to have, and I quote them, two good feeds of slauk after the Christmas excesses so that they actually could purify the blood and get themselves back to normal. That's Irish Murray Island. And there's the slough growing on the rocks. Anybody recognize it? Good. And that's an actually just been held up to the, to the camera. And what I'm saying about getting children educated and getting fruits into children, you can, there's a whole section on the teddy bear's picnic uh, for getting the seaweeds into the children. So you can put in all this healthy stuff and pack them on their way, and they don't know a thing about it. So they'll actually, it all tastes great. So they're, they'll eat it away quite happily. Uh, so that's the great thing about hiding it in gingerbread men. And, uh, and green tea and nori ice cream, which is another great favourite. Uh, chocolate meringues, again, the, the seaweed pairs wonderfully with those. And with, in fact, with the chocolate, uh, the nori and chocolate are just a match made in heaven. Um, with the uh, and nori and ginger is another fantastic one. There's some great chocolate cake, cake recipes in there. 
The sea spaghetti, does anybody recognize that? Um, again, it's just kind of like spaghetti. Uh, do I have a longer shot? I do. Would you recognize that? You see it waving and, and flowing in the, in, the, in the sea with the tide coming in and out. Again, it's got a wonderful nutty flavor and it's a great one to introduce to children because they'll just be, they won't even know it. The children who come visiting, like cousins and friends, they don't even know that the sea spaghetti is mixed up with the spaghetti. They just eat the whole thing. So, yeah, the children just get very used to it. You can, of course. Yeah, you can. And in fact, um, Manus McGonagall from Quality Sea Veg was, was the uh, sponsor of the seaweeds out on the, um, on the stands and the ones that people have been tasting for the last couple of months. They're all sea spaghetti recipes. And uh, it's called Quality Sea Veg. But I would say to you that um, support your local harvester because it's hard work. And, and it's not expensive if you go into any of the shops. In fact, our that's a fruit salad with sea spaghetti. It's just a fantastic um, mix. Um, we used to go into our local supervisor and say, will you stock seaweeds? And they'd say, oh no, uh, there wouldn't be any demand for that. And then the book came out. And I was in the shop one day. She grabbed me and said, who are the suppliers? Tell me quickly. And now there are three or four sections with all the local suppliers. There's uh, Carrick Fallen from Eastgate. There's Quality Sea Veg from Donegal. And there's uh, Low Tide from um, Mayo. So there's three that are on that are stocked, all of a different variety. They're in all the health food shops in Dublin too. You won't have a problem getting them. That's the Ilaria that I was speaking about, the Wakami. It's a relation of the Wakami. That's the one that actually there's a lot of research happening in breast cancer with that one. And uh, I just wait again to see what those results will, will turn out to be. Um, they recommend uh, seven grams of seaweed uh, per day for health. But I would suggest a mix of seaweeds for that, for that, for those seven grams. And another great salad using uh, mango, banana, and the marinated alaria, which is which is which is really lovely. You can see the pieces of alaria there in the salad. That was the oil fat that I was speaking about. Uh, the the green, the sea lettuce, and, and the sea grass is quite similar. That's a, there are wonderful recipes for that, particularly with um, beetroot. It pairs so well with the beetroot salad. So lots of ideas there to actually, there, there's the beetroot with the sea, and it takes the color of the beetroot. So it's just a gorgeous salad uh, with some simple dressings. Um, would anybody recognize that from where you're sitting? Uh, it, it does look like it, but it actually isn't. But you're right, it, looks, it does look very like it because it's a little bit too close. Uh, Chandler Rack is what this lady said, and it's like it. But it's actually corrugine. It's just the true Condus Crispus. Um, and there it is in the pot. And Granny wasn't far out when she said that um, if you take corrugine for a chest, that it actually will sort you out. Because, again, we now have an evidence base that corrugine is antiviral. And it also is an expectorant. It will shift phlegm off the chest. So, um, so listen to your grannies. And you know what that is, because I've told you. It's oarweed, the laminaria digitata. See how it floats around like an oar, and then it breaks up into the little bits afterwards. And again, it tends to be used for, for soup. That was just a drawing. All the drawings were done in the book by an artist. And that one was the? Sugar kelp, the one that looked like the crimpling, and there's a carrot and sugar kelp, uh, carrot cake and sugar kelp. That was our, um, we can skip over that one because it was our um, uh, bladder rack. Yeah, and I've been telling you about that one. And that was just a clam bake, and again, all the instructions for the clam bake are in there, which is a great occasion in the summertime uh, when you just bake all your bits and pieces in. Um, and put them, close them under, close them over with with the seaweed and the steam. That's me with great enthusiasm uh, for the the green smoothie, and uh, just to say that into the green smoothie, which I may, if I've time, I'll demo it, and if not, I won't. But in go the dandelion leaves, um, and there's your. I'm on a one woman campaign to ensure that people leave a wild bit in their garden and that they're not out pulling everything up because. Weeds, a, weed, a weed is a plant whose virtues we, we don't yet know, but we know the virtues of dandelion. If you put one dandelion leaf into your salad or your smoothie, there you have your vitamin C content for the day. So leave those wild areas. And you all recognize nettle, 
also in the smoothie. It's fantastic this time of year. Just get out there, no matter where you're living, you'll find a little patch that's away from the road and you'll be able to harvest your nettles. Because once you can get into late June, July, you won't be using the nettles anymore. You mustn't use them this time of the year. And they really are, are just give you such a boost. They're just fantastic. That's chickweed, which is, uh, again, I'm just showing you some of the weeds, and that's Herb Robert. We've got research happening with that around its anti-cancer properties. And that's cold foot, looking a little shook, but it's a, a cough medicine. It's, uh, it's, it can be made into a very good cough medicine. And there we have the smoothie. Um, <laughs> Actually, I should, um, it's, it's poignant that I'm actually looking at these two because um, they, it was my sister's wedding and uh, it was the day after it and uh, they, we brought these, these, all the geezers into um, the pub across the way and they had pints of Guinness, of course, underneath the counter which had to be put away when the photographer said, we shoot now, we're ready to shoot again and out came the smoothies. But um, the, the guy who actually wasn't in the picture is down here, and he does eat, he does take a smoothie every single day because he lives beside my sister, and she makes one for him. He's really lucky, and he's, he must be 95. And, uh, but he was down here, and this man here actually died on the 9th of January. Uh, Packy Harrison, he was a neighbour of ours, and this man came from Canada for the, um, for the wedding, and he actually died last night. I got an email. So poor old Bob Thompson. So um, yeah, so I said that he would be up on my screen and we'd, we'd all remember him. So yeah, but the smoothies, that's what you're going to taste. Now we're not serving it in pints. <laughs> um, we're just serving it in little shot glasses. And um, it, it does, uh, if you were able to see the guy down at the end of the bar, he's, he's kind of living proof. He he's limps around the place, but he just, collapses if he doesn't get his green smoothie. So it's quite interesting. But those guys were just posers. Um, so the secret then, a small amount of a wide variety on a, on a daily basis is the actual secret. And just to turn, that was the channel rack that you mentioned. Well done. That's um, uh, Pelvisha Canulicoli. It holds the water. It's very high up on, on the shore. And I'll just skip through these because I just want to, I'm just conscious of time and I want to do the demo. But I was just asking the question, how did broccoli get such a great name? Seaweeds should be out there, the different ones, naming them and actually, um, you know, get, getting them mainstream. One of the things that, I was in Japan and I found it very interesting because the doctors over there, um, they can't prescribe seaweeds, but they can recommend seaweeds. And they have so many patients, and they, they treat them. The patients have to go and buy the, the little blocks of seaweed themselves, and little capsules. And they treat hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, and liver damage. And I had a couple of hypertensive patients who were actually friends of mine. So I brought back some of the seaweeds, started them on it, and we now get it from Japan because they're just so, and their and blood pressure is perfect. But it's just seaweed. Could they have an Irish stuff? But they've, they've done really well with it, three patients. So it's just an interesting small little study. Um, but it's, isn't it interesting what, that the doctor, what the doctors actually do in Japan? And of course, you can pair up seaweed with all kinds of things that are good for your health. Uh, that's a great pairing. Uh, when you make the crisps, the Dulles crisps, and you pair it with the peated whiskey. I think here we are, we're going to do the demo. Brilliant. So um, I'm just going to move the seaweeds um, out of the way. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, you're going to take them down. Okay. So while everything is arriving, I'm, I'm just going to um, show you this. This was a scarf that was made for me in Canada as a present when I was out in Prince Edward Island. Um, because what they did was, their harvesters um, didn't listen to the researchers and they went out with big scrapers and they harvested everything off the beds. And all the corrugated stocks, the Condus Christmas stocks were all destroyed. So they invited some people from around the world to actually have a look at what other seaweeds could be used and ways that they could use them. So I was one of the people on the panel. But they gave me a gift of that, which is a piece of. Yeah, and it's ore wheat, laminaria digitata, but it's in its ore shape, and it's a scarf. So it's a winter scarf. I better not put it on or I'll knock the whole lot off here, the, all my headgear, and you won't hear me. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, it's just gorgeous. So when everything is arriving, what I might do is, I might just um, pass a book around for you to have a look at, um, because we're going to, um, we, have, we have to kind of keep to time. Um, so I'll, hand, I'll start it there, 
Um, and I think um, tonight um, in, the, in the gallery they're selling them for 30 euros and I'm happy to sign them if you want, need one for a present for somebody or even if it's for yourself. So um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to show you, I just need the black, ah, oh, here it is, um, the little cooler box with everything in it. Um, I was just going to show you how to make a smoothie because I think once you actually taste it, you're going to want to know how to make it. So I harvested a few bits and bobs um, from our garden. We we're looking to have a tunnel. So the spinach and the pineapple and banana was provided by um, Ian. He went off shopping. And then I have here uh, some of the Swiss chard. And I have the uh, seaweed, which I already um, blended. But I have some also, which I just soaked. So this was an area that I took out of a pack of quality sea veg and it was dried when I took it out of the pack and after 10 minutes it had rehydrated into this. So it rehydrates very quickly but you're probably better to soak it the night before if you actually um, do want to you know be able to put it into a blender that's not a very powerful blender um, or smoothie maker. Now again I can pass this round and you can have a look at it and a feel of it. Maybe I should take the water out of it, shouldn't I? <coughs> in case there's a spill there. So I'll just pour the water in there. And um, this is one of the things that um, you, when you soak it, that you put the soaking water as well as the seaweed in. Now there's enough there to do a mehel. I mean, there's enough there that would, you know, you're talking about using a piece about this long. Can I sit that there without it falling in? I probably can. So, but I soaked enough for everybody sort of to have a look at. Just a piece about that long, okay? Um, before your actual um, morning, you know, to put it in and snip it up so it doesn't tangle. Will I pass it around so you can have a look at it? Yeah? Um, and I hope now that it's actually dry enough. And be sure, as I say, put it in there. Will I start it at this end? Um, if you want to pop up and just... Um, and just take it and just have a look and a feel. And what I'll do is then when it's finished, I won't compost it. I'll actually bring it home and I'll give it to Rusty. Because Rusty is our dog and uh, he's a big golden retriever. And it's just amazing how healthy he is because he gets, we give him seaweed. In Wales, they actually don't bother with um, warming tablets for dogs and for horses. They give them dillisk because of the anti helminthic effect in it. And uh, our cats would be dillisk, not if, you know, no matter what you do, cats are so fussy. But the dog will actually, he tries on, on, on all, of, all of the seaweeds that are left over from, from the table. So, now, I normally use a Vitaprep, and a Vitaprep um, allows you to see what's going on. But this is a Thermomix, so you won't exactly see what's going on. I mean, I think these are about a thousand euros, aren't they? I know I paid 600 for my Vitaprep, 600 sterling, and I love it, but any smoothie maker will do. Um, any just old horse and cart of, a, of a, a smoothie maker. In fact, I have one and it's, my daughter uses it because it's really fun to make smoothies for her friends, and it's called the Kenwood to Go. And it actually, in fact, the, the two um, jugs, if Sarah's still around, are in the fridge because it comes with two mugs that you can seal down. And I made a smoothie for myself this morning and I didn't have time to drink it. And it's in the fridge, Ian. Yeah, if you just let me show you the jar. And it's just a little motor. A motor, and the motor actually is the one of the lids. And then you take it, so you just have one thing to wash up, which is the lid. And then you put on the lid. Up. Do you know what I mean? You make the whole thing in the jug. It's really handy when, when Ian brings it in. So I'm going to start off, as I say, oh, I've set that around now. So I use this, which I blitzed earlier, just for speed. I just blitzed that um, quickly in this and put it back in because I wanted to send the other one around. So I'm going to just put in my seaweed first. Can everybody see that? Now, you, you would be putting in your chopped seaweed there. And then I'm going to put in some water. Everything is just so sciencey here, isn't it? It looks like I'm doing a science experiment with this lovely Kilner jar. Uh, so a little drop of water. And next I'm going to put in now. We had a slight, um, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, no, it isn't. It's in, it's in, the, it's in the black box again, okay. the black cooler, yeah. Now, what you normally do is you dice up your bananas and you put them into one of those little Tupperware boxes and put them into the freezer the night before, or the week before if you want, but I tend to do it sort of the night before. But you can do a batch of them. If you're in shopping and you get a whole batch of bananas and they're starting to go off, chop them up really finely, put them into a Tupperware dish and throw them in, label them a smoothie, okay? 
So normally you would just put in your pineapple next, so a quarter of a pineapple, and, and you would put, tend to put in, give that a good blitz, and put in your um, banana next. But for speed, I'm going to put it all in so that you'll see what goes into the smoothie. So ideally, frozen bananas, okay? And with your frozen bananas, you actually let them settle a little bit before you blitz them. But I don't need to do that with this because they're not actually frozen. Oh, yeah, now you're disgracing me. Well, I have one for my breakfast tomorrow because I'm staying overnight. And the other one was for my breakfast this morning, which I never got to because the traffic was so bad. But do you see what I mean with these? They're really, they, they're, they're just fantastic. Um, now, your um, smoothie, I, mean, I threw in raspberries into mine this morning when I was making it. I mean, you can throw in whatever you want, but isn't that a great container to bring? And you can water it down and, you know, bring it with you. And it just, it's, they're just fantastic for bringing to work to anywhere that you're going. So I just popped that there. And, and it's called a Kenwood to go. And you get those two things and the motor. And it's only about 30 euros in Tesco or less. And it does a great job. But you do need to soak your seaweed. So what am I going to put in next? I'm going to put in some Swiss chard. And I have some nettles here. So I already got stone yesterday, So because uh, I was actually doing a bit of reading in the tunnel. And the nettles are really, really strong in the tunnel. So just a nettle, a nettle top, OK, or two. That will fill in there. The most important thing is that you actually have a variety. That Here's a little bit of kale. And you take out the stalks, because they are quite bitter. And that was another type of kale. So that was Cavallo Nero. And the other one was, I think, Westland Winter, one of those, a curly kale. But you don't, I mean, go to your local shop and see what they've got. And then if they've only got spinach, that's absolutely fine too. But don't overdo it on spinach. Because the important thing is that you actually have a, a little bit of everything. There's a, a beet leaf that you can put in. And there must be a dandelion leaf here somewhere too. That was the Herb Robert. I'm not going to put it in. I'm going to leave it there so you can see it. That's the one where they're doing all the research on the, um, on it, acts, it acts like a highlighter in the body. So if every day we have cells that misbehave. And what that Herb Robert does, they are researching. This is not evidence-based. It actually goes around that with a highlighter and tells the body, the way you highlight a document, this bit, this bit, this bit, and it highlights to the body, this, these cells here, this bit of misbehaving here, wipe them out, wipe them out, wipe them out. That's what Herb Robert is, what they're researching at the moment. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And that's running around every hedge. And it has a little, <coughs> pink, a little pink flower. Yeah. OK, I can't find the dandelion leaves. I must have um, put them all into my own smoothie. Um, and that's the calendula. Are you familiar with that? The pot marigold, the calendula. Um, the, our school garden are actually doing a, a project this year. And it's going to be a calendula pot project. And the children are selling them off to the people in the village. They've sown them all in the school and to make funds for the school garden. OK, so basically, you blitz all that. I mean, could it be simpler? No. <laughs> Did I hear no? So you just put the lid on whatever smoothie maker you have, and you make sure that I'm right the right way here. Yeah. And you make sure you put the top on it. And I think it's plugged in, and you just, no matter what kind of smoothie maker, you just blitz it. It's not, it may be just turned on at source. Okay, no worries. Um, but you're going to be tasting the ones that Sarah and Diane and I um, wrapped up earlier. And it has all that goodness in it. How are we doing on time? Are we OK? Have I time to show the seaweed bath? Oh, no, questions. You wanted questions. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Seaweed bath? Yeah, questions. Um, do you want to, have we got any questions? Sorry, it's not really a question, just by way of comment, just to say thank you for that, it's really interesting. But I'm a medical herbalist, and we use in practice all of the seaweeds and all of the plants that you have mentioned. Um, so they are already in use medicinally. I just saw one of your um, slides flash up and just said, can we use these in medicine? We are already. Um, thank, you so, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah. and, and for all, all, all of the reasons that you... 
Yeah, well, um, some more than others. It just yes. depends on the practitioner. Right. You know, so um, what their emphasis would be on, you know. Yes. And would it, would it be mainly um, fucus fasciculosis, the bladder rack? Yes, which is, is a lot. Uh, but would the alaria be used for it? Yeah, a little. And the uh, condus crispus as well. Um, great. Yeah. And um, also, yeah, for for the reasons that you that you mentioned, for the complexity yes. of, of yeah. Yeah. Uh, conditions and illnesses, yeah. And would that be particularly, you know, a niche practice, or would it be generally training for general, general oh, training? Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. So, yeah, thank you for You're thank you for making okay. that comment. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, this gentleman. Is it safe to park freely on the east coast? Say, well, that's interesting because I give courses in the Organic Centre um, in Rossinburg, County Leitrim, and um, people come from the East Coast uh, and they ask me, and I say, look, you have to go and find this clean place and, and tell me so I can tell people, but nobody has ever come back to tell me. So I'm, I'm either a bit worried or else maybe they found a secret spot and they're not going to share it. Yeah, I just want to say before you Google the organic, the organic centre is a wonderful place to go. It's a 19 acre site in Los Inver, and you can learn all sorts of things. I normally give courses, but I have uh, I was doing a lot of running in the spring and uh, and jumping because my daughter was doing hurdles and I was showing her how to do hurdles and I really damaged my sacroiliac ligament and I have not been allowed to walk for three months, which has been just dreadful. So I'm starting on a sort of a rehabilitation where I'm not allowed on rocks. It was very bold of me to go down actually and clamber over the rocks, but I really enjoyed it. And um, to get the series for you all, but I'm not going to be giving courses because I have had a strict warning that I can't do any more clambering until I, until I do this period of rehabilitation and then I'll be fully back to my normal self and able to walk again. But anyway, another question. Yes. Uh, the sodium content for somebody with high blood pressure. Okay. Um, yeah, again, this was interesting because it came up when I was just doing the interview today. Um, the cutoff point in Ireland is um, six um, because, you know, we, we I think uh, we might be behind North America. I have that in the book. And uh, their actual cutoff is uh, 2.1.5 to 2.3 in North America for their cutoff point for, for your intake, which is incredibly low. And the journalist from the UK said they were five and they moved up to six. So um, if you have specifically, um, you know, if it's somebody who actually is specifically with, with hypertension, then it's probably better to rinse any of the Atlantic salt that's clinging to the, the seaweeds before you use them. And also to remember that nori is actually the one that's the lowest containing uh, sodium. So that's worth remembering. So if you're choosing one that you stick with your, your nori. And, and then I forget which one, because I did look at this very closely, um, where, where actually I had, yeah, I had it listed um, in terms of using, using it. Um, ah, it's just, it's just a little bit. Yeah, but that's, that's the bottom line on it. I'm quite surprised. Yeah, they're 1.5 grams to 2.3 grams per day, um, which is really low. I think we probably will come down to that level. Um, but to make the point, most of your salt intake comes from processed food. So if you processed food, about 90% because of your, of your salt intake comes from. So if you don't eat processed food, if you're cooking your own food at home, and then you're entitled to add your seaweeds with, with the salt still clinging, and to add a little bit of gray salt. Never use a salt that's free flowing. Use something that's lumpy and clumpy and gray, and you've got to you know, hit it with a pestle and mortar. A great product. And Manus does it, quality sea veg. Um, is, uh, it's a little container, it doesn't cost much, and it's half sea salt and half dillisk. And you put it into your mill, and you grind it, and you're getting half and half straight away. So you're cutting your salt intake um, right straight away by, by using that product. And it's just really lovely to put it onto anything you're using, an egg, fish, pizza, whatever you're having, just to put it on it. Um, Maybe somebody at the back who didn't get any attention at all. Um, any questions at the back? Maybe you, you were about to mention the baths, and I was going to ask you, sir, 
you were about to mention baths, and I was going to ask you which seaweed was the best to use in baths okay. in terms of skin softening. I, and I was going to do um, a demo of how to, um, but maybe we're over time. Are we in? Yeah? We can do it up here after. We can do it up there after. Yeah. It's fucus serratus, the serrated rack. And it's, um, again, scissors, probably to bring to the shore <laughs> if we are going to get a little bit of seaweed. And it's, it's just a beautiful seaweed. It's serrated, I'll show it to you. Um, it's in another bowl that's up at the table. When you're having a smoothie, we'll do it. And it's just a kind of a technique when you're doing the bath um, so that you get the most of the algae in it. So it's really, really gloopy. And it's like olive oil there that you're bathing in it. So it's really fun. I mean, the baths are just great. I have to say, Harry Father, um, the company from Eski, they actually were the first people about 40 years ago to put the bath on the market. And it's still on the market. And they still do those seaweeds. They're the True Mavericks. Ian, I think it's, uh, are you giving me a nod there? I think, yeah, we yeah. need to go and, and sample. So do have a little shot with the smoothie, and we can do more questions and have a look Yeah, if you have more questions, just uh, come up afterwards. We've got the books and see what to taste, and uh, let's just give a round of applause for our friends.